All right, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Amy Netzel and I'll be your host today. I'm an instructional designer and web accessibility specialist. Your presenter today is going to be Becky Rares and she works as a coordinator for distance learning technologies. Becky and I are two thirds of Durham Tech's instructional technologies team. We work with our supervisor, Karen McFall, to support Durham Tech's faculty as they use our learning management system, Sakai. We help by providing training on how to use Sakai, as well as providing one-on-one -on -one assistance when faculty run into user issues when using Sakai. Our department also provides digital accessibility training and assistance. And we'd say it's a pretty good day for us when we know that we've helped a faculty member feel a little more confident using Sakai. During today's webinar, you will be muted. However, we definitely encourage your participation throughout the presentation via the chat window. I'll be monitoring that area and collecting any questions you might have. Becky and I have built in two Q&As during this webinar. The first will occur about midway through and the second will happen at the end. We also have a couple of participation activities planned that will invite you to either virtually raise your hand or write directly on our virtual whiteboard. If you're having some trouble hearing the webinar, please use your phone to call the number listed in the chat window and enter the PIN that's provided there. And with that, we ask that you sit back and enjoy the webinar and I'll turn it over to Becky. Hey everybody, welcome. We're going to get started with what's new in Sky 19. So let's take a look. What are we doing now? Right now we have Sky 11, we upgraded a couple of years ago. And we decided to skip one of the other versions that came out because it just didn't have everything we wanted ready yet. So now it does. So we're gonna go from Sky 11 and skip all the way to 19. What happened to 13, 14, 15, et cetera, we don't know. I guess I didn't like um, 13. So we're going to 19 on May 8th and all of your materials will transfer from 11 to 19 everything will be converted for you. So what is staying the same? Um, a lot of tools. These are all staying the same. So you don't have to worry that you're gonna have to learn a lot of new things. But there is one big thing that is changing. And if you haven't tried out the new grade book, it's time. I know we all love the classic grade book and how wonderful it is, but it's time to change and try out the new grade book. It has lots of great features and all of your grade book items that you have in all your old courses will be available in the new grade book. It's just another look and feel than you're used to and you'll get used to it right away because you're gonna go over it today a little bit. So what can you do if you haven't been working with the new grade book yet? First, you can join um, and sign up at training durhamtech.edu and you can try out our intermediate sky online workshop the very first module is the grade book we'd love it if you did the rest of it but at least you could do the grade book module and what else do you have available in the sky instructor resources area we have lots of videos and handouts about the new grade book so if you want to learn on your own you can do that as well so what is changing well, mainly it's a little new things that have been added. Most of them you don't have to use other than the new grade book. There's lessons has a few new things we like and a few we don't, which we'll go over. The big exciting new tool is rubrics. We now have a way to be able to add rubrics to our grade book and our assignments. And tests and quizzes has a really great feature that we love that we'll go over today. And the look and feels changed. So that's about it. Let's get started. So I'm going to get out of there and go over to Sky 19. So I hope that you notice right from the beginning that on the left, those icons are a lot smaller. So there's a lot more real estate to be able to work with your tools. There's another thing that's changed. If you've been around Sakai for a long time, you might remember when view site as student was in the upper right. Then it moved to the left in Sky 11, and now it's back. They really like to move that around. So now you know where it is again in the upper right-hand corner. So that's a couple of the new things that we like about the look and feel. And there's one thing I'd like you to do throughout this webinar. We're going to be asking you lots of questions, so you can't just start falling asleep. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint, and I'm going to go to 
let's see, something new. And that is, I want you to raise your hand if you've been using the new gradebook. So if you go over to the user module on the far left and look at the little emoji in the lower right hand corner, you can click on it and raise your hand. So, so the, you might have to move the area that where the presentation is out of your way. So on the left, user module, lower right hand corner of the module, you'll see a little emoji and you can raise your hand. Okay, wow. All right. I see those hands going up. So it looks like we have a split of about um, a third have used it and two thirds have it. Okay, that's good for me to know. So thanks for raising those hands about the new gray book. So let's take a look at it. If you haven't used it yet, now's your chance. So I know the new gray book is available. You don't have to worry about your old content. It's still going to be there, just looking a little di bit different. So I've added a lot of tools already, so you don't have to wait around while I add tools. And the gradebook's there. You'll see that it has a very different look than our classic gradebook. All the students are lined up on the left, and you can see there's lots of real estate on the right. So what does it look like once you've added a gradebook item? Well, let's start that out. We'll click on add gradebook item and I'm going to type in week one airplane assignment. I'm going to have my folks design a paper airplane. It's going to be worth 100 points and you can see there's now this new area where you can add a rubric if we had one and the same old things that we're used to. So let's click on create or in this case there's a new plus button. If I'm going to create a lot of gradebook items I can click on plus it creates that gradebook item and I can add another one. So I'll add one for week one discussion. I'll make it 100 points too and I'll click on create this time. So now the new gradebook shows that all of the items are spread out in a spreadsheet. And so beside each student, I can type in grades. Now, if you're not used to the gradebook looking like this, how do you change like the due date or something like that for each of these gradebook items? In the lower right hand corner, there's a little drop down arrow. There's lots of things you can do with it. And one of them is edit item details. That brings you back to the original screen that you created the item with. Now there's something else that you can do here, and that is you can type something in. So let's add a grade. So how about um, Sarah got 80 on her airplane assignment and 100 on her discussion post. All I have to do is enter the grade. And as I add them, you can see the total score of each one. Now you can see that her course grade is now 90%. Well, something new that they added to this grade book is they added a way that if someone was out sick, you could actually excuse their grade. So I can click on excuse include grade and her grade will be crossed out. I have to go and refresh it and now does her grade change? Yes. Now she hasn't been penalized for missing part of that assignment. Well, what if it turned out she made up that note and really wasn't sick? Well, I'm going to go back and include her grade back in the grade book. And if I refresh it, oops, there we go. There's her grade back to 90. Well, there's a few things I didn't talk about on the right side. On the right side, you still have something called view columns. It used to be view hide. So you can hide different items while you're grading. There's also something new this time called item order. So you can drag and drop and move your grade book items around. So if I update that, now week one discussion should be first and the week one airplane assignment second. There's something that I was really missing in the new grade book and they've added it. They have a new feature called bulk edit. In the grade book classic, you can see big long columns that tell you whether all of your grades are released to students or included in the final course grade. They've added that, but they've added it here in the new grade book so that you can actually make changes. So if I didn't want to make these grade book items available to my students or in the final grade, I can change them. And now little tiny icons appear. Let me see if I can make this a little bigger. Um, you can see that now there's a little crossed out eye beside each of these items in underneath their description. And that means that the crossed out eye 
that the gradebook item isn't available to your students. And if you have a crossed out calculator, it means that it's not included in your final course grade. So your students aren't penalized by either of these gradebook items. So how do I get them back? I could just do it by going here to edit item details or go back to bulk edit, add my check marks, click on save changes, and voila, all those special icons that were telling you that it wasn't part of the gradebook or showing to your students are gone. So that's some of the cool things that have been added about the gradebook. I think there's one more thing I was supposed to go over, something that was missing and that's been fixed. So I have a copy of this uh, course that's similar, but most of the things are done and a little bit different. And what I wanted to show to you was that in, let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger, is that it always was calculating your dropped grades in a category correctly. If you use that in a categorized gradebook or in a weighted, gradebook, but it wouldn't show you or your student that these grades were being dropped. Now they finally added the um, a crossed out uh, slash through any of your dropped grades and this kind of weird background. So now both you and your students can easily see which of your grades are being dropped. It was a little um, unusual not to see those crossed out before. Now they finally updated it and it looks beautiful. So I think that's um, just about everything I was going to talk about, the new grade book. For those of you that already know about it, I hope that helped, that you got to know about some of the new features. So we're going to do something a little different right now. Amy's going to talk to you a little bit about and ask some questions about rubrics. All right, great. Becky, that was a great start to the webinar. Some pretty neat things are going to be happening with the gradebook there. So before Becky goes into the next section on rubrics, we'd actually like to invite you to participate in something called a whiteboard activity that's here in Big Blue Button or in meetings. So we're going to go ahead and display the whiteboard. And there's a question at the top of the screen. Why do instructors use rubrics? So in your opinion, why do instructors use rubrics? Uh, Becky's going to reveal a tool panel that should appear on the right hand side. And if you're not seeing it, go ahead and hover your mouse over the, the center uh, module there. Um, and the instructions are click the T in the tool panel and then click, hold and drag that T to create a text box for yourself. And then you can uh, type directly in that text box. So we'd love to see what you think. Why do instructors use rubrics? I see a lot of folks are in there getting started. OK, we hear that uh, to be consistent with grading to communicate expectations to students, to grade students equitably, to reduce bias, to set and communicate standards and expectations, so students know how assignments will be assessed, to grade written assignments fairly, to make grading more efficient, it's a time saver, to guide students to get better responses, to provide instructions, these are fantastic responses. These are great suggestions as well. You guys have pointed out quite a few excellent reasons why instructors can and should use rubrics. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Becky so that we can learn more about rubrics in Sakai 19. Well, thanks for participating, everybody. We really appreciated that. Hopefully you're gonna see my screen. All right, so since we just talked about all the wonderful ways to use rubrics, let's take a look at one. I'm gonna start with a done rubric so you can see what we're gonna build. Then I'm gonna create one and associate with a great book item. So here's my week one airplane homework in my done course. And I'm gonna go and look at what it looks like after I've graded David Davis. So you can see he has a score of 75 and it looks like he has um, an instructor comment here. So in the grade book, you can add instructor comments, and that's by going down here into the right-hand corner, one of those items. So how did I create the, the rubric? I went into rubrics tool, created it, then I have to go to edit item details, and I have to associate it with my rubric. Once I do that, then I can grade using the rubric in the lower right hand corner of the little cell where I'm gonna add his grade, now there's a new option and I can click on grade rubric. Wah wah, there's a big rubric that I can click on, change the grade, and you can see on the right, the grade is changing for each one of these criteria and the total points are also changing. You can see that there's also a different colored uh, comment, and that's where I've added my own comments inside of the rubric itself. And you could add all sorts of descriptions. 
I'm not going to do all that today, so I don't drive you crazy with my typing. So let's take a look and try it out ourselves. So back in my course that doesn't have much in it, we, we have our gradebook items created. So I've already added the rubrics tool. So on the left, I'm going to click on rubrics. You can see I have some shared rubrics that I've already made available to everyone on our dev server. That's where we're working. And I'm going to click on add rubric to create a new one. So I'm going to create the airplane homework rubric. And it's going to be worth 100 points. So since I have a bad memory, I'm putting the 100 points in there too. So now I have a couple of choices. I have criteria. Well, I don't like that name. It's not very descriptive. So I'm going to change that to design. I'm clicking on a little tiny pencil. And that's when I can click and add the title as well as a description. I'm going to save that. Now I can decide what kind of ratings I want. I think inadequate, it's kind of mean to say that to your student. So I'm going to change that to not so good. I'm going to leave it at zero points, and I could add a description. I'm going to save that, and let's change meet ex expectations. I'm going to keep it real simple and change it to OK. I'm going to click on another pencil, and I'm going to make that wow. And oops, I got to change these these scores. They're supposed to add up to 100 points. So that's 50. And I think I forgot to change the points for OK. So I'm going to go back in and change that to 25. All right. So whew, I'm getting tired of all that typing. So instead of um, having to create all that all over again, I'm going to delete on the far right the second criteria. I'm going to click on the X, remove it. And now there's another symbol in the far right. I can click on copy. Once I click on the little copy icon, I can create a brand new uh, criteria. And this one, I want to be flight. How far are they going to fly those paper airplanes? Wonderful design as well as flight. So now I don't have to type anything else in because I'm using the same scores and the same types of ratings. So I'm really done. Um, of course, you'd add a lot more descriptions for your students, but this is a demo. So I'm going to go back to the great book and I'm going to associate with week one airplane assignment. I'm going to go and edit it, click in the right hand corner, click on edit item details. And now you can see that big green area is gone. Instead, we have the choice to add a grading rubric. So I'm going to click beside use one and I can pick which one I want. I only have one. I could preview it to make sure in case I had 50 of them that I picked the right one. Now, this is really nice. I'll show you why it's great to choose adjust individual student scores. And I'm going to click on Save Changes. Once I do that, it might take a moment or two to refresh. So let me see if I can get the gray book to make some changes. While I'm waiting for that to happen, I'm going to go back to the one that I've already created and show it to you there. Sometimes it takes a little while, while for these things to appear. Since we're on a dev server, it's not production. OK, I'm going to go over to the week one ho airplane homework. You can see that it has a little tiny um, rubric, or it looks like a little spreadsheet. That's to let you know that it's associated with a rubric. Then what I could do is I'm actually going to go and grade with the rubric. And I can make comments like, um, let's see, let's work on your uh, flying time since it was a dud and went up in the air and immediately uh, crashed. OK, he did OK. He met expectations there. So let's click on Save Rubric. And does it have 60 points? OK, so what does it look like to your students? Your students, if I click on David Davis's name, this is first my view, my grade summary. But the student review mode, if I click on that tab, this is what your student will see. So they'll see that week one airplane homework. That student's gotten 60 out of 100. And they have to click on this little rubric. Once they click on it, it shows the grade. I changed it so they only got 60 points. And if you're going to use comments in the rubric, you're going to have to let them know. They're going to have to click on the orange icons in order to be able to see what you've written to them. You can also, if you want to, type something over here in the comment area and let them know to look at the rubric uh, comments 
or you can just leave your comments like you always have in the great book. You pick which will work for you best. So I'm going to get out of there. If you notice, there's um, it's kind of grayed out all around you. This student review mode was created by NYU and they wanted to be sure that you could show your student their grade and discuss it without them looking at the whole grade book and seeing other students' grades. So that means now, what if you were a student, I'd have to tell you close your eyes because now we're going back to the grade book. Okay, so let's see if we can go back to my original one and see if it's gotten a little bit more updated. Okay, it's being extremely stubborn. So let's see if it, I'll see it's showing it, but it, let's see if now I can grade with it. Nope, oh, it's still being stubborn. Well, that's why we have a backup and why we're using uh, a development server and making changes to it. So other than creating a rubric and adding it to one of your great book items and grading with it, one other thing you can do is you can share your rubrics. So I have a couple of rubrics down here that I created and shared with everyone at Durham Tech who's on dev. So that's not a lot of people right now, but that's one disadvantage right now. Right now you can't share it with just a few people. So I'm going to click over here on the right of one of these shared rubrics and I can click on copy and I'll copy it to my site. And now I can change the name and no one has to know that I copied that from someone else. So this is Becky's now. If that was someone else who created it, it would now be mine. And I could also make whatever changes I wanted to it. So if I wanted to change like mechanics to grammar, now this has become my rubric. I can make whatever changes I want. So what if you want to share your rubric with just a few people? You could let them know. You could um, share the rubric and then you could be mean and you can revoke. If you've shared it, you can revoke it too. So um, if I've shared this, I can revoke it so that no one else can use it. Okay, so I think that's everything I was gonna talk about rubrics. Um, I think I've showed you what it looks like when it's been completed, what the student sees. So there's one other thing I wanna make sure since we know there's some questions about rubrics since it's a brand new tool. So I was going to let you know that Yes, it's a brand new tool and it works great with the great book. Usually it's a little slow today and it works well with assignments. Assignments is really well integrated with the great book. The problem is with forms. Forms is not well integrated with the great book. That's why Sakai community is working on a new forms tool. In the meantime, is it there's always been a split where if you use forms, you have to create a separate gradebook item and connect it with the topic. And that means it's not totally integrated with rubrics either, since rubrics needs to have a gradebook item somewhere. So right now, um, the forms tool is not ready for prime time when it comes to rubrics. And we're sorry to hear that since that's what a lot of us would like to do, but we're hoping it'll be available soon. The other thing that you can use is tests and quizzes also allows you to use rubrics, but it's kind of hard to associate a rubric with multiple choice questions. So there's real limits to how much you can use it. There are a few questions that you can use it with, and that is with short answer essay. That makes sense. But if you're going to use the rubric, your students, um, they won't be able to know in the grade book that it's associated with a rubric. They have to go inside of tests and quizzes. So if you're going to use a rubric in tests and quizzes and you want your students to be able to see it, you'll have to release tests and quizzes and the, and the feedback to your students so that, that they could see the rubric. They can't see it without feedback. That's the only way your students will be able to see what you scored them with in your comments. So that's just a couple of things I wanted you to be aware of. Um, can rubrics um, be copied from site to site? Yes, they do. So any rubrics that you create and don't want to share with the world, you can copy it into your brand new um, course the next semester. So how about students? When do they get to see your rubrics? Well, you saw that your students can see it in the great book, and I'll show you in a little bit that it works well with assignments, but um, they're not going to be able to know 
if it's in tests and quizzes unless you tell them and release it to them. Right now, they can't preview rubrics. They can only see the rubrics after you've done and completed the scoring. We've asked that they make the rubrics available before they have to fill out um, and submit a paper or complete a test. So they are working on that. The other thing that is a problem with forms is right now, you can't even, your students can't even look at the rubric after you've graded with it. It's the only tool out of the four that you can't, the students can't see even the rubric results. So that's another reason it's not ready for prime time. So I think that was everything I was gonna talk about. Um, there was, I believe I, I covered everything, but there was one question I wanted to ask. And that was, <clears throat> How would you like it if there were reminders for your assignments? What if there was an email that could be sent out and that your students could be reminded that their assignments are due? And it would be sent to only the students who needed to submit it, and it would be sent 24 hours before the due date. Does it sound pretty good? Sounds good to me. So that is the one little change that they've made to assignments. They also changed the order of it, which I don't know why, but you know, they like to do things. So I've created um, assignment. I've already filled in most of this, so we don't have to go through me filling in each of these items. But I wanted you to see that they've added a new checkbox that you can use, it's optional, and you can send the reminder email 24 hours before the due date. So this would send out to anyone who hasn't submitted this assignment on um, 24, 24 hours before it's due, your students would get a reminder. So I thought that would be nice, really nice, since that seems to be a problem for a lot of students. And I just thought I'd show you that um, if you want to be able to use an assignment with a rubric, you can choose a rubric, like I could choose my reflective X essay, take a look to see if it's the one I wanted and adjust the score. So let's post it. Okay, and let's see if I can refresh that a little bit. All right, so there's assignments and there, what the, how they've changed, not very much, but a little bit. So I think it's time for a break. So I'm gonna go, since we've covered a couple of tools, assignments, rubrics, and the gradebook, so we're going to see if there's any questions out there. All right, Becky, thank you. This is a great first half of the webinar. So we haven't had any questions come in yet. So if you happen to have one, go ahead and type it in the chat window now. But Becky has given this presentation several times before in face-to-face -face sessions, and there were a couple of questions that came out out of those sessions that we'd like to share with you today. Uh, so Becky, the first question was, what if a faculty member has only used Gradebook Classic up until this point? What will happen with all of the items they have in their old gradebook? Um, what can we do with your gradebook if it's classic? It'll be converted to the new gradebook. If you're using new gradebook, of course, it'll work in the future. If you're using both, they'll both be converted and available into one gradebook. All your data will remain available from your past gradebooks in your prior courses and in future. That is good news. All right, one more question that came out of uh, those previous sessions was, what if I have a rubric that one of my colleagues would be interested in using? How would I go about sharing it? So you can go into the rubrics tool like I showed you and you can share it with just a few people if you tell them or you can um, share it with everyone in the school. And we've asked if they could make it a little bit um, uh, more private so that you could choose who you want to share it with when they're working on it now. This is kind of rubrics um, alpha beta right now like 101. So they're trying to get as much as they can out there and make it available to you. All right, Becky, we have a couple of more questions that came in. Uh, test grades would show up automatically in the classic gradebook. How about in the new gradebook? Same thing. Your test grades will, as soon as you save them and make, and if it's automatically graded in tests and quizzes and you have the gradebook associated um, with your tests, your grades will show up um, as soon as you, as soon as the multiple choice, say if it's all multiple choice, the grades will show up immediately in the gradebook. As long as the gradebook item is associated with a test, your grades will transfer just like they always did. So the next thing we were gonna talk about was tests and quizzes. So they have made a few changes that we think are for the better. 
And one of those is right now in Sky 11 in tests and quizzes, you have two different tabs. You have to use working copies for whatever you're working on right now, like drafts, and you have published copies for tests that you've made available to your students. So what is going to be available in the new version? In Sky 19, they decided those tabs are driving people crazy. So instead, they're going to allow you to have all your quizzes in one place, and you'll either have a status of draft or some type of published. So it's either draft or published and active, and it can also be published and inactive after the due date or before the due date. So the other thing that's going to be available is in the past, whenever you wanted to copy any of your tests into your new course, it copied everything in working copies. So it's, that's going to remain the same. All of your drafts are going to be copied into the new site. And your published uh, tests are only going to be available in the current site, in the current semester. So that's one big change that they've made. So let's go take a look at it. I think I've got everything. I'm going to go back to see to tests and quizzes and let's take a look oh it looks similar to my um, handout that i just showed we have three different quizzes and they all say that they're in draft mode and instead of select actions there's an action tab but it contains all the things you're used to and you can see they all have a status of draft everything else you're used to is displayed as well to the right so let's try this out so that you can see the new feature, the other feature that's available in tests and quizzes. So I'm going to go to settings. In the past, we're used to seeing um, a tab for about this assessment and availability and submissions. None of that has changed. We also still have grading and feedback and layout and appearance. None of those have changed, but we have something new. So let's see how many people in the past have had students ask for extra time. If you can let me know, you can go over to your user module and click on your emoji and let us know if you've ever had a student who needed extra time on a test. So has anybody had that happen to you? Okay, it looks like a few people it's happened. All right, well, if it does, it, right now it's a little painful to set up. You have to add a group and copy your test. Now they've made it really easy. So if I click on exceptions to time limit and delivery, I have some new choices. So I can select someone like Sarah. And what if it turns out that she needs time and a half? Let's see, this test, if I look up here, is 10 minutes long. So if I go back to exceptions to time limit, I'll make this a time of 15 minutes, time and a half. Now I'll click on add an exception. Now when I look below, I see that Sarah Smith's been set up. It kept the same st start and end dates, and it changed the amount of time that she's going to have access to the test for 15 minutes. So I can affect anyone except Sarah. Woohoo! All right, what if you have something else that happens? What if David goes to the Bahamas and he's gonna miss one of the weeks when he could be working on his test? So what we're gonna do is change the late submissions accepted. Let's see this. The, right now, students have until April 25th. So let's give him an extra week since he's gonna be gone during part of that time. I'm gonna click on done. And, oh, I better, um, change the time limit. So there's this really fine print that tells you that when you're changing the date availability, if you have a time test, you also have to add the time. So let's click on add an exception. And now you'll see that David, his test is still available and due the same times as everybody else, but he can submit his test late. And he has 10 minutes. Oops, I gave him 10 hours. Oh my gosh. So let's edit that and let's make a change and see what we can do here. I can change that from 10 hours. Boy, he's really going to have um, a lot of time to work on that test and change it to 10 minutes. Let's update that exception. Oh, I did that on purpose, I'm sure. And so now he's got 10 minutes. So what if um, I selected someone and I forgot to add the time limit on a time test? Let's add another person give them some more time, uh, 
and let's add an exception without changing the time limit. I just want to prove to you that you do have to put that time limit in if you create time tests. It doesn't do it automatically. That's the only thing I don't like. Other than it would be nice to see the dates and times you already have set. But it works. It's a lot better than anything we did before. So that's what we have available now. Um, let's see. I think there's a few things that I wanted to now talk about in lessons. So let's see. We've gone over rubrics, gradebook, a little bit of assignments. Let's look at lessons. There we go. So I have available here four different sub pages, one for each week. And you'll see that something here says this is an empty sub page that I made available 314. So let's see if that's really true. Yep, I hit it until 314. Now this was something that was really annoying and that was after you had released one of your sub pages, it still displayed this text, not released until, even though it was already released. Woohoo! They fixed it. So now you only see these red displayed items when it really is a sub page that is due in the future, like 425, or you've hidden it. So that's one thing I wanted to make sure that you knew about. Let's see if the other thing that I really like is it seems simple, but it really speeds up your time is if you go to site info, there's something new in manage tools. And if you go to the far right, on the lower area, you'll see a new check box that you can use. It's really mal a big mouthful, but it'll, it'll be available really fast. Enable lesson subpage navigation in the left tool menu. Okay, I'm gonna continue and I'm going to finish. And now you should see that there's a right facing arrow beside lessons. If I click on it, all of the week subpages that are available to students are on display and you can quickly go to them. Boop, boop, just like that. So I wanted you to see that, woo, I love it. I use it all the time now. But weeks three and four aren't displayed to your students because they're not available yet. So let's see, one other thing on here that I wanted you to notice is um, I have my name up here welcoming me um, and I didn't type that in. So what did I do? You can personalize lessons or anywhere there's a text editor and add in braces, double braces, first name, last name, or full name. And that will display not your name or my name, but your student's name. So when every student comes to wherever you have um, that customized, personalized statement, they'll see their name. So that's something new that they added that I really like. So let's look at week one. I've already set up a whole bunch of items that I want to my students to create. There was one thing, though, I wanted to ask you about. Um, can you go back over to the user module? You have to do something. You can't fall asleep here. So you have to go back over to the user module and click on that emoji if you've ever used the checklist in lessons. So it's OK if you haven't, but if you have, let us know. Okay, we've got a few people. Oh, a few more. Okay. All right, we might have people who haven't used it or are sleeping. Okay, we got one of those two. All right. Well, for those of you who don't know what a checklist is, in the past, what it was was somewhere that you could go to add content and you could go down to add checklist. I've already done that part. That's what this is over here on the right. Then what you can do is when I edit it, I typed in a description. I typed in each one of these items and then I saved it. In the past, what students had to do was they had to check for themselves when they completed one of these items. And you could then see that by going to a new little icon and you could see whenever someone checked off. Well, none of my students have done anything yet, so you can't see it yet. Well, the only way that um, that your students could use this was if they did it themselves. They had to self-check. And that was great. Half my students did it. I never even required it. Some instructors did. But what's even nicer is if you use it now and you do two steps, two additional steps, 
the checklist will automatically be checked off for your students as they complete tasks. So what I've done is I've gone to each of these items and you see those stars, those asterisks, I've required each of these items so that um, students have to complete those. And because I want to track who has completed it and submitted items. So how do I make something required? Whenever you edit any of these items, usually the last checkbox is require. And if it's something like assignments or tests, or if it's a discussion form, it requires the students submit something as well. So in this case, I can click on uh, the webinar description. And if I now refresh, it'll show that I've completed that task and there's a check mark. And you also see there's a check mark on the right. Well, how did I get those two to link together? Requiring it isn't enough. The other item I did was I went and edited my checklist and now every single item, other than one that you have to check yourself, which is read your chapter one, um, there's a little link here available for each of these items. So I haven't set up the the relationship between the required week one discussion topic yet. So I can click on the little link. I can choose week one discussion. It knows all the items I required and click submit. Now I can click save and will it work? Well, let's try it out. I'm going to click on week one discussion. I'm going to go to start a new conversation. I'm going to type in something that would get me an F, but I'm trying to be fast here. So I type in hi, click on post. You can see up here, there's um, the opportunity to return back to my week one sub page. I return back and you'll see that there's a check mark beside week one discussion and a check mark in the checkbox as well for my checklist. Now, what would happen if I only clicked on discussion or if I only clicked on discussion and didn't post anything, it, it records only a check mark beside each of the required items and in the checklist if the student posted the forum post. They also have to submit the quiz and they also have to submit the assignment. Unfortunately, um, they only have to click on a file or click on a web page. Well, here I also try out a question. If you're not familiar with questions, you can also add questions and require them and it'll automatically record when you've completed questions. So where are those items at? There is add checklist, add question, as well as comments. You can also require students to make comments and it'll record it and follow whatever your students do. So I thought that was pretty cool that we have checklists available that are automatic. So let's see if there's anything else that, oh yeah, I want to show you what it looks like when it's done. So let's go to our done Sky 19 site and let's go to lessons. Let's whip into week one. And this is what it looks like when I've had a number of students complete some tasks. So at the top, it lists every single item that you required and that you also added to the checklist. So one of those items I can't require. It has a column and beside it you can see each student and what they've submitted so far or completed. So it looks like Jill and Sarah have done a lot of the assignments other than two. Um, they haven't read the syllabus or watched a video. Those are the only two things they haven't clicked on yet. And it looks like Jill, oops, hasn't checked for herself that, that she's read chapter one. So that's what it looks like when your students complete it. The other thing I wanted you to see was um, there's a lot of other new uh, features that they've added to lessons and we don't like them. So I wanted to show you what some of those were. So in add content, there's also something called add resources folder. Add learning app is something that doesn't even apply to us yet. And um, we also have embed calendar embed announcements and embed forum conversations. I don't know what they were thinking when they made these up. They weren't talking to the UX people, that's for sure. So I've already added a folder here using that tool and you click on one of your uh, folders and that's what it filled out here is a selective folder and it displays everything that you possibly put inside of the folder. 
And so, oops, I just went and changed it. That's not what it did. Let me see, click on images. Now it shows three different images with wacko names. I'm gonna save it. And now it displays those weird names. Once it's in there, you can't change those names. So there's no way to change the names displayed to your students and make it more um, human readable, unlike these. If you forget to add, to select one of the folders like I just did, it shows everything that is possibly in resources. I don't know why you'd want to do this. Why not just link to one of these files and come up with a user-friendly name for it? Okay, the other thing that they provided is you can embed a calendar. Woohoo! Oh, yeah. The only problem is um, it won't embed any other calendars other than the calendar in this particular Sakai course. And it's not really ready for prime time yet. Um, here's something that I went and asked that a calendar entry be added for this uh, assignment that I created earlier and posted, and yet the start and, and end times aren't displaying correct. So that's definitely not ready for prime time and takes up a ton of real estate. Oof, why not just go to the home page or overview page? The embed announcements I think is one of the worst. Um, it shows your announcements in a really wacky way and it only shows the first five, the very first five. So if you have 20 throughout the, the semester, they'll only see the first five unless you start deleting them, which seems kind of odd. And why would you want people to look at your announcements where usually in lessons you add activities? Okay, the last one is that's kind of weird is they've added forum posts. Now that sounds like it might not be too bad, except it looks ugly. And the other problem is it posts here and displays every post in every forum that someone just went into and made an entry. So if someone goes into general discussion, goes into week two, goes into, you have maybe another form available for people to chat, well, it's all gonna show up here, all the latest posts. And it looks perfectly ugly. So we don't like any of those. So we don't recommend that you use those new features in lessons. So I think that's everything that I wanted to be sure that I talked about. Um, let's see. Uh, the last thing I wanted to go over was syllabus. Now, don't worry, the syllabus tool works just the way it did before. You can add uh, the title, you can add as many attachments as you want. The only thing is, is when you wanna edit it. So if I click on this, you used to be able to click and edit. Well, now it doesn't edit. So the only change here is if you need to make changes, you can still add attachments, so that's fine. You can still delete the ones, but if you need to change text or the title, click on the edit button at the top. Now, if you just wanna change the title, you can change it here and save it. But if you wanna change text inside of it, you'll have to click on edit details, and now you can change the title and the content. And so, whew, we got here. Okay, and then I'd skip all this other gobbledygook unless you wanted to add an attachment and click on add and publish. And now to get back to the syllabus and see what it looks like, you have to go to the top and click on the syllabus tool. Now you should see that I added, woo, we got here. So that's the only change that we found about the syllabus, but it was a little tiny tricky. So we wanted to make sure that you were aware of it. So Amy, how are we doing on time? Becky, we have about nine minutes left. Okay, well then it sounds like I can show a couple more things. Um, the other things that changed just a tiny bit was the roster. The roster now shows three different views of all of your students. So first you can look at cards with pretty pictures. You can look at a photo grid, which highlights their pictures, or you can go back to usual list where it displays their email address and little tiny photos. And you can still, um, sort groups, you can still sort by roles, but you can also search. You can still export and still print your syllabus. I mean, excuse me, your roster. Woo, got syllabus mixed up with roster. Now, what about the chat room? The only change here in the chat room is now when you say something, um, it also displays your little icon associated with your profile. And how do you make changes to that? You go up to the right hand corner, in the upper right hand corner, you can click on preferences. And now you can go to your profile. This is where, whoo, 
you can change your picture. Um, and I think that was everything that I wanted to talk about and show you. So I think we're ready for questions if we have any. All right, very good. Uh, if you have a question that you'd like to ask Becky, uh, we've gotten to the second half and to the end of the webinar. Will the online workshop or training be updated to version 19 before May 8th, or do we have to wait until May 8th to access version 19 via the online training or workshop? And I believe Gregory's talking about the intro and intermediate to Sakai. Oh, okay. Well, right now um, we're gonna make available Sakai 19 sandbox for all of you after um, we're done with this workshop. We've got half of your site set up and we're going to make more for you so that you can try it out and do all the things that I just did. Um, as far as training, we're working on updating the intro and the intermediate as fast as we can so that they will um, be ready for Sakai 19 after May 8th might take us a little bit of time to update a few of those things, but that's our plan anyway. We also plan on having um, those uh, Sakai 19 updated in our instructor resources area as well, not just Sakai 11. So I hope that helps. That's absolutely right. Okay, and Caroline would like to ask a question. She says, Karen said that Duke was also upgrading to Sakai 19. Is that true? That's what we've heard, is that they're also upgrading Duke as well to Sakai 19. And a number of different um, universities and colleges are. We just don't know about most of them. Okay. And then a couple of other questions that came out of earlier trainings. Um, somebody back then wanted to know, in lessons, how does that cool personalization work? Where does the student's name come from? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the student name is coming from your roster. So whatever is the first and last name that's displayed in the roster, that's what can be displayed when you use the personalization in the text editor. So if you have students who don't like their first name, you might want to only use their last name instead. Um, otherwise, you don't have to use it at all. It's totally optional. You don't have to use personalization if you don't want to. Okay, and Courtney's wondering if you could review how you set up the personalization again. Okay, I'll show that to you, but just so you know, um, we're going to give you um, a handout afterwards, after this workshop, so that you know how to do it yourself. Okay, so if I go back to where I was in lessons, um, go to the front page, what I did was I just went anywhere in a text box and I added first name. So I'll show you how I can add braces and say um, full name. Oops. You know, it won't look pretty, but you'll get an idea. And my other one was um, last name. I keep wanting to capitalize everything. Okay, last name. And I'll click on save. So I can display first name, full name, last name. I can type it wherever I want in any text box. Very good. And then a uh, final question is, will my students see that new organization for the subpages that you turned on for the menu? Yes, your students will. And that's why I wanted to point out that when you have some of your pages hidden, your students won't be able to see them. So they can see each of the subpages you've made available to them, like week one and week two, but your students won't be able to see week three and four like you can. So yes, it's available to your students. All right, very good. So on behalf of Instructional Technologies, Becky and I would like to say thank you for attending today's webinar. We hope that you feel as though you have a good idea of what to expect when Sakai 19 rolls out next month. And if you're interested in attending an encore of what's new in Sakai 19, Becky will be providing one more face-to-face -face training on April 24th at 2 p.m. That training will allow you to have a hands-on look at Sakai 19, and Becky will have a little bit more time to cover some topics and examples that we just had to admit today due to the time allotted for the webinar. We invite you to register at training.durhamtech.edu. And in a week or so, watch for a follow-up email from us. It'll contain some great resources, including a link to the Instructional Technologies webinars page, which will have a recording of today's webinar, answers to the questions asked during the session, and additional information about the Sakai 19 upgrade. The webinars page will also provide you with access to the Sakai 19 upgrade handout. Instructions for how to access your own sandbox version of Sakai 19 are going to be provided on side two of this handout. 
If you'd like to try out some of the things Becky went over today, you'll visit durhamtech.dev.longsite.com. We call this instance of Sakai our dev instance or our test server. Anything you do here will remain separate from our production instance of Sakai where your class sites are located. Any exploration or work you do in dev cannot be copied over to production nor vice versa. So you won't need to worry about clicking something you didn't mean to click. Production and dev are basically two islands with no travel privileges allowed between them. To sign into dev, if you're interested, you'll use your Durham Tech user ID and your password. And these would be the same ones that you usually use to sign into Sakai every day. Once you're signed into Dev, you'll need to click Sites in the upper right hand corner and then locate the webinar Sakai 19 workshop site underneath the training section in Sites. If you don't see the Sakai 19 workshop site by the time you receive our email in about a week, please contact us at sakaihelp at durhamtech.edu. We know a number of you joining us today are adjunct instructors, and we hope that the online delivery method of this workshop helped make it possible for you to attend. Durham Tech's Teaching and Learning Center sponsored this webinar today, and so the college's foundation offers a stipend of $50 per semester to those adjunct instructors who attend two or more TLC activities during the semester. Given the distance between us today, Instructional Technologies will submit the Adjunct Teaching Institute form on your behalf so that you will receive credit toward that stipend. If you are an adjunct, please type adjunct in the chat window at this time so that we can make sure that we submit a form on your behalf. And we thank you once again for attending today. If you have any additional questions, please send us an email at sakaihelp at durhamtech.edu. Thank you for attending today, and we hope you have a great afternoon.